we haven't finished with the moral conduct yet, with the moral discipline, so it's going to go on. The next thing that came after the ones we did yesterday, one abstains from high and luxurious beds and seats. Now that's always a, a precept which comes with the eight or the ten and um, it's always misunderstood. People don't know what to do with it. What's a high bed and what's a high seat? Well, it refers to beautiful throne-like seats and it refers to these enormous four-poster beds and uh, exaggerated luxurious kind of things. Now the Buddha himself was a prince and before he became the Buddha and had lived in what was then luxury. So maybe what we, if we were to think of an um, immense uh, mansion somebody lives in with uh, numerous rooms and uh, um, wood paneling and uh, crystal chandeliers and uh, and, and numerous bathrooms everywhere with golden fittings and things like that, exaggerated luxury, which, of course, that wasn't the case in the, in the Buddha's time, but what he had in the palace was considered to be outstanding luxury, and his life was one of enjoyment of the senses. The, uh, everything was geared towards the enjoyment of the senses. And uh, it said that he had n numerous concubines and uh, dancing girls and uh, music was being played. Everything was geared in that direction. And when it, he decided to live a spiritual life, he completely turned this around the, to a complete change which was absolutely the difference of that, the, the total opposite. Namely, he went into the forest and he practiced austerities. The story says that he ate one rice corn a day until he got so thin that all the ribs could be counted. And sometimes we can see Buddha statues where he is depicted like that, where every rib is seen on the statue. Then it said that he held his breath for so long until it was whistling out of his ears. And he would stand on one leg until the other one became so, um, so weak that he couldn't use it at all anymore for some time and other things like that which was and still is a practice of um, renunciates in India but he found quite clearly that that didn't do anything on the spiritual path for him on the contrary what he found was that it prevented him from meditating properly so then he came to the conclusion after some, after trying that for quite a long time, that there has to be a middle path. And that's what it's all about, the middle path. It's neither luxury nor is it austerity, asceticism. It's a normal everyday kind of a care and attention that one has to pay to the body but it's not a search for sensual pleasure 
Now, the search for sensual pleasures, and we'll get that again, is the most detrimental activity that we can possibly undertake against the spiritual path. And the whole world does it. Everybody is looking for sensual gratification. And with that, we are making an enormous barrier for our growth, for our inner growth, because the sensual gratification, while we can get it, of course, not always, but quite often, doesn't last. So we have to work at it all the time. But that's not all of it. One of the worst things of it is that one is constantly being disappointed also because it doesn't fulfill. And with that pressure on top of one, life it does not become pleasant. So this is what high and luxurious beds and seats are all about. It's neither luxury nor is it uh, asceticism, an ordinary everyday kind of bed which hasn't got anything special on it. And as actually later there's some mention of all these things that they were using to make it specially wonderful. Yes. <laughs> we don't even think that these things are something special. So we have to remember also that in our affluent Western society, we are always leaning towards the luxury side. We're always going overboard on that side. We are very difficult in this kind of society to have a very balanced view of what is the middle. So one should actually go through one's house, through the cupboards, through all the rooms, and get rid of all the things one doesn't need. And the things one doesn't need are those that one hasn't used in about a month. One doesn't need any of that. Out with it. Give it away as presents. The place becomes nice and empty and one can find things much easier and one isn't, hasn't got so much clutter around one. Not this idea of it may be useful one day or getting more new stuff, piling on top of it yet. So we can have a good look at our own things and see if it isn't been used for a whole month, I'm sure nobody's ever going to use it again. I lost my page. There we are. So it's the utter luxury, huh? A person abstains from dealing in gold and silver. Well, that means being a merchant. It means that uh, buying and selling. It's, um, of course, impossible for, for monks and nuns, but it's also for any kind of uh, spiritual activity, the less one has to do with that. One less one has to buy and sell, the easier it is. And now come some things that one shouldn't accept, but they don't make much sense for us nowadays. I'll read them out. Accepting uncooked grain, raw meat, women and girls, male and female slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and swine, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, fields and lands. So these were all things that people would give away, I presume, and uh, I mean, nobody's ever tried to give me something like that, so <laughs> <laughs> I never had to say no thank you. <laughs> The, uh, the one thing about the uncooked grain and the raw meat is that um, if you have to look after uh, cooking and kitchen work, I'm quite sure you have already noticed that that takes up quite a bit of time and it is absolutely essential to do because the body has to stay alive and if one isn't monk or nun, one has to do those things. But people who have taken the spiritual path as their only priority in life, only, they are not to do such things, and if they're not given any food, well, they'll just have to go without. Have to be willing to go without. And the ownership of animals. Now, 
I've never given it any thought about goats and sheep and fowl and swine, elephants, cattle, horses and mares, but I do know that those people who have pets at home are always in a quandary whether they can come to a meditation course. Who's going to look after the dog? Who's going to look after the cat? And so forth. Cat a little easier than dog. Dog is always a problem. That happens all the time. No, that's one thing. The other thing is that there is another cause for attachment. And although um, people have their strongest attachments to other people, they also, of course, have difficulties with other people because they talk back, which cats and dogs don't do. So one can become extremely attached to them, or even little birds that one keeps. And um, it is almost like sometimes it becomes absurd, the attachment. I've known of cases where the attachment is absolutely absurd. I don't want to go into it because it's really uh, not sensible anymore. So if one wants a spiritual path, the less encumbrances there are, the better. The emptier the rooms and the house or the uh, apartment is, the better. And the less one has to do about all these things, the easier it is. And owning fields and lands, I mean, there's nothing worse than owning property. It's, uh, it's one of the worst things in life because one is responsible for the thing. And not only does one have to pay some taxes, one has to keep it in order, one has to uh, look after it, one has to have insurance policies on it, and one is also, because one owns it, one has to be responsible for all its, whatever is going on with it, one has to be the one that has to look after it. Um, the bigger the land, the more difficult. It's, um, so this these precepts, this, particularly this one, ha is often being broken by um, monks in Buddhist countries owning fields and land. And when they do, they are, these monks are then like ordinary uh, landowners. They are no longer really on the spiritual path. One can notice it. They don't have to say anything because they have so many responsibilities looking after all this stuff that goes on that um, they have no time for anything else. One abstains from running messages and errands, but that's explained later what kind of messages these are. Uh, here we are. The, the, not to engage in running messages and errands for kings, ministers of state, katyas that are uh, warriors, Brahmins, householders or youths who command them, go here, go there, take this, bring that from there. One abstains from running such messages and errands. In other words, one doesn't do this in order to please. And that is a very um, um, useful thing to know about, one doesn't have to be a monk or nun for that. If one wants to help somebody, that's fine. but. If one runs around, and some people do that, in order to please others, and it isn't really a useful thing to do, then one should take stock of how one is spending one's time. We only have a limited amount of time. The amount of time we have is limited by how long the life force is going in our body. So who knows? If you ever go to a cemetery, and I like to do that very much, especially old cemeteries, you will find that people are buried there at any age, from one day old to over a hundred. Any age at all. 20, 17, 6, 19, 32, 45, any age. There is absolutely no um, safety from death. So our time is limited. So we must have a look at it and see how we use it. 
and often people make the mistakes to do these things, messages, errands and things like that in order to please, in order to gain some appreciation, especially like when it says running messages and errands for kings and ministers, in other words for important people. Abstaining from buying and selling, well, one can't be totally exempt from that when one is um, uh, in, the, in the household life, but I do know quite a lot of people who use going shopping as entertainment. They don't really need all the stuff they're buying. So it's not the most uh, useful kind of thing to do. It really brings the mind down onto a level of such um, ordinary, everyday kind of thought processes that it then has to, you have to use another determination and energy to get it back onto the meditative uh, kind of thought processes. So the less we disturb the mind, the better it is abstaining from dealing with false weights, false metals, and false measures. Well, it goes on the line, doesn't it? Abstaining from crooked ways of bribery, deception, and fraud. Abstaining from mutilating, executing, imprisoning, robbery, plunder, and violence. Well, those would belong with the first one, eh? the killing, and the other one with the stealing or the lying. All that pertains to moral discipline. So instead of having just five precepts listed here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, ten. There are twenty listed here. But they're all connected. They're all connected to the main one, the main five of killing and stealing, not, not killing, not stealing, and uh, not using um, falsehood, lying. So there are, there are, the only other thing that is in addition here is the beautifying oneself, the being, using too much luxury and too much marketing, too much dealing. Now then comes another section on moral conduct. And there's some they are even getting more refined. And the more one can refine one's moral conduct, the easier it is to keep the meditative mind going. From the sheets that I get uh, from most people that come to the courses, one can see that the meditation went very nicely for about six weeks after the course finished and then the whole thing collapses again until they come to the next course. There are always, of course, um, uh, admirable exceptions to that. But most people find it extremely difficult in everyday life to keep the meditative mind going. So if we can use some of these injunctions to help us stay on that kind of level, it will be of great benefit one won't be able to use all of them because some of the things will just be necessity and that one's own sen common sense will tell that but one can refine and refine not to you in not to have the use of stored up goods such as stored up food drinks garments vehicles bedding scents and comestibles not having stored up goods. In other words, not storing a lot of stuff which then one... Um, one of the reasons for that is that it actually enlarges the me illusion. The more one has, the bigger one appears to be. And this is the reason why in our society it is considered to be successful to have more, mm. to be a person that owns a lot. It is the kind of thing that people are striving for. It is actually one of the 
ideals has always been one of the ideals of American society. The Horatio story, that you start with nothing and you build up an uh, empire. You own things. And the reason for that is, is the support system for the ego. So the uh, having a, a stored many things in one's house and what is only mentioned here is food, drink, garment, vehicle, bedding, fence, but one can, when you get home, you can open your cupboards and make a new list what's stored there. Now there's a list of unsuitable shows. Let's see how that fits in with the TV program. Shows featuring dancing, singing, or instrumental music. Theatrical performances ballad recitations, music played by hand clapping, cymbals and drums, art exhibitions, acrobatic performances, combats of elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, goats, rams, cocks and quails, staff fights, boxing and wrestling, sham fights, roll, co roll calls, I don't know what that is, battle arrays and regimental reviews. These are all unsuitable shows. Well, we could add a few more to that, couldn't we? Like all the crime shows that people that were out on television and all that type of thing. They, uh, it just takes a mind away from inner growth and just puts it on a totally different wavelength. Now, the, the wavelength that we are on in a meditation retreat should be quite different from, a from the wavelengths we're on in everyday life. And I'm sure everybody can feel that. There are, of course, moments when the mind just doesn't want to follow and just does other things. But eventually, it quietens down. It can't help but quieten down. And it feels at ease in that quiet. And it feels happy about not having to deal with that which is always judged, good or bad, mine or yours, wanting or resisting. This is our constant judgment. In the meditative mind, there's no such thing. There's nothing to be judged. So when we look at these shows and we can make um, assessments of which ones we do want to look at and which ones we don't, but as a um, general explanation, the less chance we give the mind to go on to these judgmental qualities and to the duality of what is out there and what is in here, the less chance we give it, the easier it is for the mind to be quiet and peaceful and harmonious. I can't imagine that anyone who watches some of these dreadful things on television could be quiet, peaceful and harmonious. It's, uh, the, some of these things are quite... Um, probably exciting, but they certainly cannot bring any kind of inner peacefulness. So this is what's meant here. So these are the things that the people were looking at in those days. Now we come to some games and recreations, which are not uh, useful. And these, I've, most of them I haven't really heard of. Eight row board games. Ten row board games, imagine board games. Well, I would imagine that there's something like chess and uh, those things that are played on a board. Hopscotch, spillikins. Anybody know what spillikins is? No. I don't either. <laughs> uh, dice, stick games, finger painting, oh. <laughs> <laughs> ball games, blowing through pipes playing with toy plows, turning somersaults, playing with toy windmills, with toy measures, with toy chariots, with toy bows, guessing letters, guessing thoughts, mimicking deformities. So these must, <laughs> <laughs> these must have been the popular games in those times. I, I find this uh, interesting from a standpoint of historical knowledge that uh, what the people were doing in those days, and we can always translate it uh, to what we're doing. Um, these are 
used for the mind to well, distract itself, for distraction. And uh, so that we also have then the mistaken idea that we're getting out of our dukkha. And while children should play games, and it's never been said that the Buddha never said children shouldn't play games, uh, for grown-ups, it, he has always said that it would be better to look at reality. This was the reason why he said being an actor is not a good livelihood, because it doesn't depict reality. It shows something which is a fantasy. Now, one could think of, of the possibility that the, the script is trying to portray reality, but it's still a script. So, for these games, again, trying to distract the mind, and then we pretend there's no dukkha. While we're playing a game, mostly we wouldn't have any dukkha. And then we think, oh well, if I do that, then I'll be without dukkha. So we play. The use of high and luxurious beds and seats, spacious couches, thrones with animal figures carved on the supports. I've seen those. Long-haired coverlets, multicolored patchwork coverlets, white woolen coverlets. Now, white wool must have been extremely expensive. White and black wool is mentioned often as luxury. Woolen coverlets embroidered with flowers, quilts stuffed with cotton, woolen coverlets embroidered with animal figures, woolen coverlets with hair on both sides or on one side, Bedspreads embroidered with gems, silk coverlets, dance hall carpets, elephant horse or chariot rugs, rugs of antelope skins, choice spreads made of kadali deer hides, spreads with red awnings overhead, and couches with red cushions for the head and feet. So these must have been the epitome of luxury. So maybe we can translate that into things that nowadays we might be using. If one is on a very definite spiritual path, then all these adornments which are made with all this um, embroidery and made with colorful, uh, colorful uh, gems or even valuable gems and uh, animal skins, it's all left behind. It's not being used. The, uh, the simplest of things are plenty good enough. And sometimes even these things, I mean not this exactly like that, but things like with luxurious things are given. And people are really determined and have seen what the world offers they give those things away again. And one doesn't keep the, uh, such luxurious things. So luxury is another ego support. Look at me, I've got really valuable, beautiful things. They are valuable and beautiful on the outside. But are they valuable and beautiful on the inside? Where does the real value lie? Where can we find it? in a bank account, in a safe deposit box, in a house, where is the value? It can't be found in any of those things. Everybody tries to find them there. When one is young, one is always looking for that, unless one is already quite advanced, even when young. But there's nothing to be found. The real value and the real beauty lies within, in one's own heart and mind, and there one can find it. Everybody's got it. It's hidden very often, most of the time, through thinking and judging. The worst of it is the judging. And it's also hidden, of course, through our desires, what we want and what we want to get rid of. But it's always there, it's always available. 
all we have to do is quieten down but not take in too many sense contacts and start meditating and we'll find it and as we find it we will be it's so much easier then not to look for luxury if one hasn't got anything within of beauty and value naturally one looks for the beauty and value outside something has to be somewhere so one looks for it outside but having found it within there's nothing to look for because one can see what it is it's just an impermanent material concoction it and uh, which consists of the four primary elements that's all it can be it can be nothing else four primary elements and only when the beauty and value within is is clear will there be absolutely no attraction to these things none i once um, went on a, a walk in in one of the big towns in germany in hamburg with a monk who had just come from sri lanka very old monk and uh, one of the few meditation masters and we had we went through in order to go where we wanted to go we had to go through one of these shopping malls which was a passage like a passage and we walked through there and he looked right and he looked left and then he said to me isn't it wonderful how many things there are which i don't need <laughs> <laughs> this was one of the most uh, luxurious and expensive shopping malls in hamburg and uh, it was amazing there were things in the show windows i didn't have a clue what they were i couldn't figure out what it is and he probably had the same experience he just said it's not wonderful so much i don't need it and of course we always think that what we buy we really need we have to one day make a decision to start distinguishing between need and greed they are very close together if we want to make a distinction between them we'll have to be very careful very mindful there's no blame attached to any of this this the buddha wouldn't have talked about it if it wasn't human this is the way it is but we don't have to go on with it because i would say that all of us have already tried and did it make us happy did it change anything by having more it usually brings pleasure the moment one gets it and that's the end of it then now we've got something new after having had it for 10 minutes it's old already the attraction that we have through the eye is then translated in the mind to the wanting and this is our um, hindrance because there's too much available we can never come to an end of it only of course our bank account puts a limit on it and then people find that very um, disturbing that the bank account puts a limit on it it rather has it that wouldn't but that would be even worse I know a man who is a multi 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 millionaire. He does nothing all day long every day other than investing his money because he has so much interest from his multi millions that he has to reinvest that all the time. and he goes all over the world and i'm not exaggerating one tiny bit he goes all over the world trying to find places where he can invest his money so that it will bring more interest he's one of the most unhappy people i've ever met he hasn't got a moment's peace nothing 
not at all. There is no limit to what he could buy. And he doesn't even buy anything. Doesn't seem to have anything particular. So the whole thing is a is a myth. A myth which is constantly supported by society. Because people don't know what else there is. So then we want beauty and value. We've got it within. That's where we can find it. And if we mean it seriously to find it there, we also need to know that any of these other things that shows and games and things like that take us away from that inner pathway. Our mind is extremely fickle. Every meditator knows that. It's very fickle and it's also easily influenced until the day when it can no longer be influenced. So with all that we have to watch it carefully. So these are the things that one shouldn't have. Let's see what else we have here. Ah, yes, devices for embellishing and beautifying. Rubbing scented powders into the body. Using scented oils. Bathing in perfumed water. Kneading the limbs. Mirrors, ointments, garlands, scents, face powders, makeup, bracelets, headbands, decorated walking sticks ornamented medicine tubes, rapiers, sunshades, embroidered sandals, turbans, diadems, jack tail whisks, and long fringed white robes. Now some of these things are available today, some are not of course. I don't know that we can have whisks made of jack tails, but um, we can have a lot of other stuff. And that applies to that precept of not beautifying oneself, but accepting oneself the way one is and not trying to be anything that one is not. And the more one has that within, that inner honesty, no um, difficulty in showing oneself the way one really is because there is nothing anymore that one needs to be ashamed of the more one is also quite willing to look the way one looks and not do anything particular about it. So these, all these um, beautifying elements, again, of course, are ego-supportive. When we look better, we think we are worth more. The best way to look is the inner happiness. That looks really nice. No powder and lipstick can substitute for that. And um, all the other things that we can wear, bracelets and headbands and all sorts of things. Sunshades, I don't know what's wrong with sunshades if you're in the sun. Must be something that's decorated, sunshades. garland scents, face powders, makeup. Well, makeup, it says. I don't know, it doesn't say earrings, but I'm quite sure that they were wearing earrings in those days. Does it say jewelry? Hang on. No? no they, well, it says bracelets. Yeah probably is. He probably should have said jewelry. Yeah. It's a man translating, of course. What would he know about <laughs> bracelets and jewelry? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he probably never, never wore any. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, all of that is, um, is, the, is a support system for our delusion. All of it. It supports the delusion of who we are. Now then, now comes an explanation of what idle chatter is. 
and that's not uninteresting at all <laughs> talking about kings thieves and ministers of state in other words <coughs> politics politics and the other thing is um, yeah, robberies and things like that armies dangers and wars talking about wars food drink and garments now the first lot the war business that is conducive to hate people have such opinions the um, opinions and the uh, sentiments I heard when this, this Gulf War was going on everybody was having their own personal war going and um, food drink and garments talk about that uh, is conducive to greed wanting one doesn't like this one wants something else and lodgings is the same greed talking about garlands and scents uh, relations vehicles villages towns and cities and countries well all of that is conducive to wanting talk about women by the same token talk about men which is uh, the uh, conducive to the uh, sexual desire so the the locker room talk that type of thing um, talking about heroes street talk and talk by the well now we don't have that anymore it was it's actually quite nice you can see it still in the more underdeveloped countries that the women meet at the well and it goes chit 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 um, and usually one can't understand because it's a foreign language um, but the Buddha says all oh, that's idle chatter not to waste one's time mostly one's wasting time like that actually the coffee uh, at, in most offices there's a coffee right the well. right that's the well right <laughs> the coffee machine or the, the water cooler right <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly it's exactly the same thing and uh, what we don't have now is a street talk because people don't sit out in the street so much as or meet at the well um, the same thing happens like in lunch hours at in the offices and things like that it's an awful lot of idle chatter and it's very often if there's a bunch of men it's about women and if it's a bunch of women it's about men and uh, it can easily be about politics and people get extremely heated up about politics and uh, about war and the other these are all subjects which are not elevating to the mind they're all subjects which are marketplace diversions and they keep the mind locked in in such an ordinary kind of um, thinking process that it's very difficult to lift oneself out of it and often people who don't know about this and you are used to this and every well, most of the world is used to this when they then come and hear Dhamma talk all of a sudden they realize that that's very happiness producing because it's something entirely different it doesn't have anything to do with this ego assertion of wanting and not wanting it doesn't have anything to do with this judgmental business I like him and I don't like her and look at her and look at him but it has a, a totally different connotation so this is why the Buddha always wants this conversation to be something on the noble path talks about it in a moment um, talk about those departed in days gone by like the good old days um, rambling chit chat speculations about the world talk about gain and loss one abstains from such frivolous chatter I'll say something about gain and loss there are the eight worldly dhammas and the eight worldly dhammas are called loss and gain the um, happiness and unhappiness 
fame and ill fame and one more praise and blame now these eight are part of worldly life we always have all eight but most people practically everybody only wants four of them they only want the gain and the praise and the fame and the happiness nobody gets it everybody gets all eight and because we only want one one part of this and not the other part which belongs with it we're pressuring ourselves in some manner or form or we're pressuring those around us to supply only the four that we want it's impossible it doesn't happen it never has and never will anyone who gets and when we have gain we must have loss and happiness and unhappiness are always there until enlightenment all these things are always there so because we reject the one and are on the search for the other we have this duality within where we can only be happy in one way if everything works our way and anything that doesn't work our way either we blame somebody else or we blame ourselves or circumstances those are the three possibilities but there's nothing to blame that's the way it is and as long as we are worldlings that's why they're called worldly dhammas puttajanas worldlings so long we'll have all eight and only if we can accept that and see it and just let it move on it all flows it arises and ceases then we are living with the law of nature and we don't have to use any resistance or rejection and we also don't have to use any craving <clears throat> and clinging for that what we think is desirable the for the gain one and the praise one and the fame one when we see how it comes and how it goes the only reason we only want those four and not the other is again for the ego support in order to know that we have to inquire into it it's no use now saying oh yeah for the ego support that's right okay finished it doesn't help anything or anybody one has to find out why do i want to be praised why do i want to gain something maybe i want to gain even in meditation something maybe i want to gain respect maybe i want to gain devotion god knows what one wants maybe i want to gain a, a raise in salary maybe i want to gain whatever it may be why do i want to have fame why i want people to appreciate me why investigate it's a very important to see that in oneself because the more one sees it the more absurd it becomes it's a total absurdity it has absolutely no um real rationality behind it we can we know all know where there's sun there's shadow so it's the same with this but in the world this is the way the world lives and they're called worldly dhammas because the word dhammas is also phenomena dhamma is also the teaching the law of nature but it's also phenomena and in english we put an s at the end to make the distinction dhamma is a phenomena so there he talks about so we shouldn't that's another thing not it's also idle chatter to talk about gain and loss and it's frivolous chatter it said here so we don't speak about things which are really um meaningful to us and others 
And then, not to live, uh, not to engage, it says, in wrangling argumentation. To abstain from argument. It's a very important, extremely. Because arguments lead to dislike. And they lead to rejection. So it's on the negative side, it's on the hate side. So there, these arguments are now um, examples. One doesn't say to one another, you don't understand this doctrine and discipline, it is I who understand this doctrine and discipline. How can you understand this doctrine and discipline? You're practicing the wrong way, I'm practicing the only right way. I'm consistent, you're inconsistent. What should have been said first, you said last. What should have been said last, you said first. <laughs> what you took so long to think out has been confuted. Your doctrine has been refused, uh, refuted. Sorry, You're defeated. Go try to save your doctrine or disentangle yourself now if you can. So it is a, a, a typical argumentation which happens very often with people who practice with their heads. They, they learn and learn and probably know a lot, but they make up their minds about the way it is supposed to be. And they don't, haven't, haven't got the inner experience with it. So this is what this is all about, because the Brahmins, the uh, priest caste, were in, uh, engaged in argumentation and they argue, argued with the Buddha tremendously but that's not all the monks uh, uh, following the Buddha also argued enormously and uh, one time it came to the point where they were arguing so much that the Buddha said that's enough, I'm going and he said I'm going to the forest and you can argue as much as you like. And he went away. And the story says that he went into the forest, quite deep into the forest, and of course there were no supporters there to bring him food, so a monkey came and brought him mangoes, an elephant came and brought him bananas. And he lived on that quite happily. And that's quite possible, he can live on banana and mango for a while. And uh, then the lay people woke up to the fact that he disappeared and they went in search of him and they found him and they begged him to please come back because they weren't hearing any decent Dhamma anymore. So he said to, to tell the monks that if they were to stop arguing, he'd come back. So the monks promised they'd stop their argumentation. Who was right and who was wrong and who understood it and who didn't understand it and how to practice and how not to practice. Now, this was nice in the Buddha's day because they could always ask the Buddha and the Buddha could tell them what was right. But what about today? Argumentation without end. Huh? Nobody there to tell what is really right. And uh, so not only this kind of argumentation, but when we start arguing ourselves, check out the motivation behind it. Why? Why do I have to, why am I arguing? Do I have to um, prove that I'm right? Why can't I be wrong? What's wrong with that? What's the difference between being right and wrong? So what, what's really the difference? It's perfectly right to be wrong. It doesn't make any difference. So uh, why am I arguing? Do I want to convince somebody else that I know more? If somebody else doesn't want to go along with what oneself is saying, so it's all right, isn't it? What's wrong with that? It's a constant self-assertion, that's all it is. It's all very interesting what one's got to find out for oneself, especially when one starts arguing. Self-assertion. Now, argumentation is not the same as having conversation about difficult topics where one may have one or the other understanding 
Argumentation is when one self thinks one is right and the other one is wrong. There's only one opinion and that's the right one and the one I've got. That's argumentation. But if one has discussion, that's a different story altogether. And one of the things which one learns from the meditative path is that a view is a view by any name and can always be wrong whether you've got it or I've got it. Views are just views. And if one believes one's own viewpoints, one can't practice. Because the viewpoints one has are all blockages, every single one of them. They are all based on the wrong assumption. So when one has a viewpoint, one can say that. This is my viewpoint. And then somebody else says, oh, but I have a different one. I say, yeah, that's fine. So we have two viewpoints. And when you go around the world asking everybody about the same thing, you probably wind up with five billion viewpoints. Mm-hmm. That's fine. No problem. The only problem is when one believes one is right. That's the problem. The only thing that can be right is the absolute truth, which one can gain through losing this idea of I am. And when I am not, I can also not be right nor wrong. Right? Maybe sounds like a paradox. (laughs) So that's the wrangling argument. Then we have something, running messages, I read that already. And then we have, oh yes, now something about um, the kind of talk again. See, the, they are the same type of moral precepts again, except they're more refined again. There's more to them. Here now it says not to engage in scheming, making schemes, not projects, but schemes which um, would probably have no basis in reality. Talking, hinting, belittling others, pursuing gain, abstaining from such kinds of scheming and talking. Ah, That kind of scheming and talking is also meant as gaining material support from donors, which is um, through just asking and talking about it and asking for it. So that also is moral discipline. But in, in this, in our case also, for the ordinary person, that means that we don't have material gain at, as our basis for discussion. But our basis for discussion should be things that are really um, helpful to our growth. Now, I've already talked about friendship and with the five hindrances which are also going to come along here have several different antidotes but they all have one common antidote and that is noble friends and noble conversation and the Buddha spoke about this many times I already told you about the good friend is the whole of the holy life. Now, noble friends and noble conversation. And this is what this is all about. None of these things that are mentioned here in speech are noble conversation. They are uh, worldly conversations. They are, um, the Buddha calls them street talk here. It's a kind of talk that one can hear on the street anywhere. If we want to be on a spiritual path, we have to have conversations which are about matters which are concerning our inner being, our inner growth, our spiritual life, our understanding, our non-understanding, our devotion, anything like that, but not the kind of street talk.
talk. And this is a noble conversation which are the common antidote for all five hindrances because they are the food for the mind. And the kind of food that we give our mind makes the mind. So eventually we have to be very careful to give it only health food. Just like we like to give the body the good food. Now we come to the wrong livelihoods and there are lots and lots of them. They are very interesting too because we can see how these people used to make a living. Prophesying long life, prosperity, or prophesying prosperity, or the reverse, from the marks on a person's limbs, hands, feet, etc. Now, reading, reading hands, making a livelihood out of that. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal ball gazing. Uh, divining by means of omens and signs, you know, like reading the tea leaves and stuff. Uh, making prophecies on the basis of thunderbolts and celestial portents. That is considered to be astrology. Making a living by astrology is considered also to be a wrong livelihood. Is it wrong to do it or just to earn money to do it? Earn money from it. In interpreting ominous dreams, telling fortune from marks on the body. Now, so far, we haven't found anything that we're not doing. We're doing all those things, aren't we? Um, oh, this is a funny one. Telling fortune from the marks on cloth gnawed by mice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Offering fire oblations. Offering oblations from a ladle. Now that's interesting because in Germany at New Year's you buy these lumps of lead and they are heated over a fire and then you throw them in cold water and fish them out with a ladle and then the, the shape it comes in that's supposed to tell you what's going to happen next year. And there were some people that always knew exactly what it meant. They all looked quite misshapen and looked like nothing. But uh, it's a very um, uh, common pastime at New Year's. But I don't know that anybody made money with it. This is for livelihood, huh? Offering oblations of husks, rice powder, rice grains, ghee and oil to the gods. Now this is where the whole misery came about that the Brahmins, the priest caste, were so down on the Buddha because he said this, that's not how you make your livelihood and the Brahmins were doing that. They were being paid, what means where? They are. They are being paid for doing that. They offer ghee and oil to the gods and they offer rice powder and rice grains and they get paid by the people for whom they're doing it, they're like intermediaries between ordinary person and the gods. And then they give, do these uh, chants or whatever it is they do, and then promise the people that there will be results. Like the child is going to be uh, good in school, or the grandmother is going to recover from the sickness. And it's being done today just like it's always been done. Nothing has changed. And of course the Buddha said, that's not the way to use religion. And um, the Brahmins were, of course, very upset with him. Offering blood sacrifices to the gods. Well, today one can still see that, especially there's a, a Kali temple in um, where I've seen goats being slaughtered. Is that in Nepal or India? I can't remember now. Hmm? Kathmandu, yes. And the, the blood's just running into the little stream there. It's, uh, and that's supposed to bring good fortune. And the people who do it get paid for that, of course. 
making predictions based on fingertips, determining whether the site for a proposed house or garden is propitious or not, making predictions for officers of state, laying ghosts, knowledge of charms to be pronounced by one living in an earthen house, snake charming, oh, that's still being done, poison craft, scorpion craft, rat craft, bird craft, crow craft foretelling the number of years that a man has to live, reciting charms to give protection from arrows, reciting charms to understand the language of animals. These are all wrong livelihoods and debased arts. This too is moral discipline. So some of these things um, are obviously um, still being done today, some here in the West, some in the East, uh, all of it mm, denounced by the Buddha as a wrong way of making a living because it makes the person for whom it's being done dependent on somebody else's knowledge or non-knowledge rather than practicing. See, the, in India, then and today, it is believed that if you dip yourself into the Ganges River, particularly at sunrise or sunset, and particularly on, on some holy days, that you're being cleansed of all your uh, defilements. And the Buddha said, even then already, that not by washing in the Ganges River can one become cleansed of one's defilements, only by purifying her heart and mind. And so is the same with these things. If one depends on prophecies and astrology and the I Ching and uh, whatever else people and the tarot cards and all the other kind of things that people try to depend on and people make a living by doing that, they are fostering this kind of dependency rather than telling people to practice or rather than having giving them a chance to practice. And that's what this is all about. I'll do the next one also. Huh? Interpreting the significance of the color, shape, and other features of the following items to determine whether they portend fortune or misfortune for their owners. Well, it's the same dependency again. Gem gems, garments, staffs, swords, spear spears, arrows, bows, weapons, women, boy men, boys, girls, slaves, elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, fowl, quail, iguanas, huh? earrings, oh there we got earrings, tortoises, other animals, so not, not to fortune telling in other words. Now predictions, predictions as the king will march forth, the king will return, the king will attack, the enemy king will retreat. The enemy king will attack, our king will retreat. Our king will triumph, enemy king will be defeated, enemy king will triumph, our king will be defeated. Thus there will be victory for one and defeat for the other. Politics. Again, predicting. There will be an eclipse of the moon, eclipse of the sun, eclipse of a constellation. Sun and moon will go on their proper course, aberration of sun and moon, Constellations on proper courses, aberration of constellation, a fall of meteors, a sky blaze, earthquake, earth roar, rising and setting, darkening and brightening of monsoon and moon, sun and constellation. Such will be the results of moon's eclipse, sun's eclipse. Such will be the result of rising, setting, darkening and brightening months, uh, moon, sun and constellations. He abstains from such predictions. <coughs> Predicting there will be rain, there will be drought, there will be good harvest, there will be famine, security, danger, sickness, health. They earn their living by accounting, computation, calculation, composing poetry and speculations about the world.
I would say that the accounting computation and calculations are also concerned with predictions. I'm, I'm positive that that does not um, mean an accountant in a business because the Buddha had um, businessmen as his followers, particularly Anag uh, Anagapindika, and I'm sure he accounted for what he was doing. So these are things that are, although they take one away from the spiritual life, they are not necessarily wrong livelihood accounting and that sort of thing. But the speculations, if one makes a livelihood with that and the predictions, that certainly is wrong. I think this accounting, computation and calculations has again to do with, uh, uh, with uh, predictions, fortune telling in other words. Now come some other wrong livelihoods. Arranging auspicious dates for marriages. Both those in which the bride is brought home and when she is sent out. Auspicious dates for betrothals and divorces. Auspicious dates for accumulation or expenditure of money. Reciting charms to make people lucky or unlucky. Reciting spells to bind a man's tongue or paralyze his jaws make him lose control over his hands, or to bring on deafness, obtaining oracular answers to questions by means of a mirror, a girl, or a god. There is such a thing as oracular answers by means of a girl in Kathmandu again. It's uh, called the, the goddess. She's a girl that is, is remains the goddess until she has menstruation, and then she can get a new one and she is like a little oracle. Worshipping the sun, worshipping Maha Brahma, the highest Brahma, bringing forth flames from the mouth, invoking the goddess of luck. So these things, um, um, auspicious dates and that type of thing, we would probably uh, have something to do with that when we use I Ching or astrology. So. If that's done as a livelihood, it's not considered right livelihood. I'm going to finish all the wrong livelihoods so that we're going to get something to different tomorrow, okay? Yes. Okay, promising gifts to deities in return for favors. Now that's a very uh, uh, common thing in, in the East particularly. And... Uh, promising gifts uh, to deities in return for favors. I don't know whether we could uh, find the equivalent in our culture where people might um, make vows that they will, you know, uh, make so and so many prostrations to a deity if they are some, if they're going to get some result or uh, do so many Hail Marys if they're going to get a result or something like that. So that promising gift. Demonology. Something, some signs about demons, huh? Inducing virility and impotence. Preparing and consecrating sites for a house. Giving ceremonial mouth washes and ceremonial bathing. That's that bathing in the Ganges River. Offering sacrificial fires, administering purgative, expectorants, ear medicine, eye medicine, nose medicine, counter ointments. Now that does not mean that being a doctor is a, is a wrong livelihood. This is a wrong livelihood for people on a spiritual path who are committed to the spiritual path and are not a doctor. Uh, if they're do that doesn't mean doctor is wrong. Practicing as a children's doctor, as mi administering medicines to cure bodily diseases. These are only wrong livelihoods for someone who is, has, is not practicing as a doctor. That is a wrong livelihood for monks uh, who were doing that, that uh, they are um, giving out such um, medicines, although they haven't uh, studied it, haven't studied the... Um, um, studied as doctors, 
or practicing surgery I didn't even see that curing cataract so the Buddha was very much against doing anything other on the spiritual path than the spiritual growth in one's own heart and mind because being part of the whole of this existence each part that is changed changes the whole so if there is one arahant about one enlightened person the whole ambience of the whole planet is changed just as if there is one demon about such as Hitler the whole ambience of the whole planet is changed so it is not, as is often said, or not often, sometimes said, that to become enlightened is selfish. That's um, almost could be considered to be a bad joke because the Buddha became enlightened. Anyone who gains access to that inner purity changes the whole of the environment so the um, the Buddha was not concerned with, for people who were really committed to this path that they should do anything else they should not go into medicinal uh, aspects fortune telling um, changing things because one can get powers and not to use them only for an arahant, for a fully enlightened one and only then if it was absolutely essential so any of the things which are outside of the spiritual practice were shunned and were considered to be wrong and it's quite clear from what is said here that this is what the Buddhists instructions were also while the Buddha was um, had completely humane ideas the uh, those people that were his disciples monks and nuns were not instructed to do social work social work was something that was very important to do for for lay people who had that kind of um, wealth that they could do that but um, people who are committed to the spiritual path were enjoined to stay with that so there's a last uh, thing last uh, paragraph great king the bhikkhu who is thus possessed of moral discipline sees no danger anywhere in regard to his restraint by moral discipline seeing no danger don't want like that room it's full of furniture <laughs> <laughs> seeing no danger to make bad karma one feels secure because one has a good conscience one has that utter security of knowing that one has kept on a straight and narrow path and that's what this is this is a very straight and very narrow path there is no there is no leeway to do whatever one likes because whatever one likes is always connected to sense pleasure so the um, the danger is removed one feels at ease and secure it doesn't mean that one has as the Buddha was against asceticism that one has to constantly um, feel ob obsessed with things that one can't do it means the opposite it means that one has understood that those things in the world don't help one anyway they don't help 
So why, why get involved? Just as a noble warrior who has defeated his enemies sees no danger anywhere from his enemies, so the bhikkhu who is possessed of moral discipline sees no danger anywhere in regard to his restraint by moral discipline. In other words, he has defeated the enemy of the sensual desires. Endowed with this noble aggregate of moral discipline, he experiences within, within himself a blameless happiness. In this way, the bhikkhu is possessed of moral discipline. Now, the blame, blameless happiness Because he feels non-remorse and because of this non-remorse, of this blameless happiness, it is much easier to have the meditation aspects of rapture and tranquility because the mind is already on this wavelength. It feels already happy. And that's why the Buddha said, in order to meditate successfully, one has to be comfortable in mind and body. If one worries about things one has done and said, if one worries about things one wants to get or wants to get rid of, one can't meditate. When the mind is at ease, it's easy. Now, obviously, one wants to meditate in order to have the mind at ease, but it's catch-22. We have to have the mind at ease in order to meditate and then we get the mind at ease. Quite simple actually. One just has to do it. <laughs> now this is the most um, detailed explanation of moral conduct to be found in any of the um, discourses because it goes much further in every one of the precepts and it shows that we have our own choice we can choose what we like but it shows that for the path to lead to total freedom one has to keep on letting go the Buddha said that the obstruction to Nibbana is clinging so what's the opposite of clinging? letting go so as we can let go little by little, obviously not the whole thing all at once, but one thing at a time, little by little, one can then find that the mind is far more one-pointed, straightforward. It knows exactly where it wants to go. And it doesn't get um, unsure about its direction. It knows this is my direction, this is where I'm going. That one hasn't got there yet makes no difference at all. But when one constantly puts oneself back into the world with its desires, then the mind becomes very unsure. Maybe I can find it out there. I know somebody who is really happy and they are not spiritual at all. So maybe I can manage all just have to do it a little better than last time. This is a very common doubt which arises because the world is glittering and is like fool's gold. It glitters but it doesn't have value. It's always there. The spiritual path is not connected with worldly endeavor. It happens in the world, the spiritual path. It has to happen in the world because we live in the world. But the mind looks for a different direction. So that gives many aspects of that. And some of them, as you can see, have no bearing on us because we don't do that thing anyway. We don't kill goats in a temple and things like that. But we do have lots of superstitions. And if you read any of the esoteric mag magazines which are on the market, we could make a list twice as long as what's in here or three times as long. Crystals 
and uh, uh, lines in your hand and uh, astrology in, I haven't read it so I don't know what's in there but I know they're that thick and everything is being offered and people go for it just then as now no difference <coughs> this is the end of the first part of this sutta the first part as in most of the teaching is sila moral conduct Please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments. Fill your heart with forgiveness for yourself for anything that you think you've ever done wrong or thought or said wrong. Forgive yourself completely. It's all in the past. This is a new day, a new moment. Let the past rest. And with that forgiveness in your heart, embrace yourself with love and care. Think of your parents, forgive them for anything you think they've ever done or thought or said wrongly. And with that forgiveness in your heart, love them, embrace them. Think of those people who are close to you. Forgive them for anything that has ever disturbed you. Recognize all the good and wonderful qualities. Embrace them with your love.
think of your friends forgive them for anything that you might have disliked think of all the wonderful things that they have done and said and embrace them with your love and friendship And think of your neighbors, people you work with, people you have any dealings with in your daily lives. Forgive them for anything that may have disturbed you. Love them, care for them. thinking only of the good qualities that they have. 